when we begin to discuss the views of Pythagoras on the subject of poetry, uh, we are a little bit reminded of the terse manner in which uh, the late Calvin Coolidge often answered questions. We can say of Pythagoras, he was for it. And from this point on, we have to look elsewhere for further information. We know that the Pythagoreans made use of a number of so-called heterodox ideas in connection with therapy. We also realize that nearly all of the work of Pythagoras was highly specialized and highly scientific. He was perhaps the greatest researcher of antiquity. And in his um, school at Crotona, he carried on continuous efforts to solve human problems. He wrote extensively on the use of herbs, on various phenomena of color and of music. But unfortunately, his original writings are not known. Either they perished or remain like so many monuments of antiquity, awaiting discovery in some well-concealed well place. We do know, however, through Porphyry, a little something of the Pythagorean concept of poetry. And we gain a trifle more from the studies of Aristotle, who apparently did have access through Plato to some of the fragments of the original Pythagorean learning. Out of Porphyry, for example, we find a fragment such as this, that ailments upon the right side of the body uh, should be treated by odd meter, and that on the left, and those on the left by even meter. Now this does not seem much, but it does tell us that it was more than a mere enjoyment of good reading by the sick, that there was a special purpose involved. Porphyry also goes on to tell us that Pythagoras was a strong believer in the development of rhythmic patterns in motion, in sound, in color, and in life generally. Thus we may understand Pythagorean aesthetics, particularly as these may apply to music, poetry, and the dance. Realizing that there might be something of interest in this department, and recognizing that the effect and influence of Pythagoras have been long experienced in society, it seemed advisable to uh, make a brief survey of some early opinions concerning poetry, and even somewhat more recent attitudes and findings. It opens a very interesting and stimulating field. In the first place, poetry as an art is perhaps the closest by direct affinity to mysticism of any that we know. Even today, conservative critics of poetry refer to it in terms of absolute and relative vision. They explain that poetry represents a condition of consciousness not to be found in any other art that we know, but perhaps most nearly uh, parallel in music. What then would be the essential therapeutic difference between, we will say, poetry and music. The principal difference would lie in an element of rational or intellectual transmit, uh, transmission. In music, we have the harmonic principle and the melodic line and the rhythmic pattern. But we do not have a direct transference of intellectual meaning. 
We do not have the musician usually conveying to us a particular and purposeful mood. Now we may definitely feel that music does carry, and it does, a tremendous emotional surge. Music can cause us to feel. It can, to a measure, direct the condition or direction of feeling. It can give us a sense of exaltation. It can depress us. It can stimulate, pacify. It can produce a series of these moods. But with poetry, something else is added, and that is a particular and direct meaning, a meaning conveyed by words. This means, of course, that poetry is somewhat less universal than music, inasmuch as music will cut through the barriers of language. On the other hand, poetry is more intimate, more personal, and the creativity of poetry is more universal than the power of the average individual to compose or create music. The creation of music generally requires a highly specialized type of training, whereas the creation of poetry, some of the greatest poetry that we know, has resulted from comparatively little technical knowledge. It has arisen as a more direct expression of rhythm in consciousness itself. Thus we have many persons comparatively uh, without technical knowledge, even of poetry, who are able to create good poems, uh, create them because of certain laws or principles resident in consciousness itself. Pythagoras, of course, uh, differed from modern man in a number of his attitudes toward health. Whereas today we throw particular therapy against particular ailments, the Pythagoreans were inclined to use a general therapy against a general ailment. The Pythagoreans were among the early psychologists to recognize that man's particular difficulties in life arise from general principles, from factors perhaps deeply submerged, but that the person is not sick because of one thing that he does, nor can he be caused to recover by the direct treatment of his immediate ailment only. We may be able to cure the ailment or treat it successfully, but curing the ailment does not mean curing the person. We may neutralize certain expressions of excess, whether these be psychological or physical. But we have a larger problem, and that is preventive medicine. We have the need of recognizing that health is a natural state that the primary end of therapy is to preserve health, not to restore it. The fact that the individual is subject to innumerable ailments must bear witness to innumerable weaknesses in his own consciousness. To reach these weaknesses may and usually does imply a general restoration of his nature not the mere correction of a particular difficulty. Thus we do treat particulars when they arise, but only when they arise. And by that time, our essential problem of health has already passed into a problem of sickness. The prevention of the rise of particular difficulties requires the establishment of general principles. The individual must keep his health from the total psychological integration of himself. He may lose his health in any particular if this total integration is insufficient. Thus Pythagoras, instead of thinking constantly on how to merely remedy certain ailments, recognized that there is a primary type of ailment. 
and that this ailment ri arises from psychic disturbance involving the total personality. The sick individual is telling us something besides the symptoms which we are able to immediately recognize. He is telling us that in various ways there are shortcomings in his general nature. These shortcomings do not provide the energy necessary for the restoration of the balance or equilibrium which would preserve health. Therefore, having at his disposal only an inadequate degree of self-integration, he proceeds to advance along the course of ailment until something of a definite nature appears, which is then treated according to its symptoms and not according to its cause. If, therefore, man is subject to innumerable uh, vicissitudes of health and emotion, it is also true that he is uh, troubled or burdened by innumerable restrictions or limitations within his own consciousness. And the work of the Pythagorean in healing was from the beginning the effort to establish a new relationship between the individual and his inner life, and through this inner life, with the world around him. In this respect, almost all ancient peoples uh, had recourse to certain arts. The origin of these arts we may never know, inasmuch as they originated in man's own unfolding need. We find that certain persons, have been from the beginning peculiarly sensitive to types and orders of aesthetics. That primitive peoples not only have music and rhythm and the dance and song and mantram, but that these various aesthetic expressions become part of their entire social culture. Primitive society, as one uh, anthropologist has noted, is actually founded squarely upon primitive ritual. And this primitive ritual is nearly always a ritual of song, dance, and rhythms. Now why man should instinctively and inevitably come to this rhythmic approach to life uh, can be explained perhaps best in terms of his own psychic organization. As Lao Tzu, the Chinese philosopher, pointed out, life is motion. Good life is good motion. Poor life is poor motion. Motion in which uh, there is dissonance, discord, broken rhythms, will be the poor kind of motion. Motion which moves, flows, and unfolds harmonically, rhythmically, melodically, gracefully. Such motion bespeaks health. Therefore, the cultivation of motion begins within the individual himself and requires a certain imposing of self-discipline upon motion. Motion is very closely interrelated with emotion. Emotion is a kind of motion. It is a qualitative motion within the soul itself. Therefore, emotion must also be rhythmic and harmonic, or else it will be dissonant. And all discordant actions of man arise from discord within man and in turn impose discord upon society. Society, thus afflicted by the discords of the individual, becomes itself discordant and reacts upon the internal rhythm of each person making up the social order. Thus both Pythagoras and Lao Tzu recognize the importance of the cultivation of motion, that this cultivation of movement, orderly, rhythmic, harmonic, had to do with the preservation of health. And if health were, is lost by one cause or another, the cultivation of rhythms helps to restore the harmony of the individual. 
When we come down to a more practical level of thinking, we must also divide humanity into a series of groups according to their reaction to rhythm or harmony. Some persons appear to be oblivious to harmony. Even a great intellectual like Dr. Samuel Johnson declared that poetry was nothing but prose jogging along like a trotting horse. He had no real understanding of it or appreciation for it. The same attitude uh, has been present in a number of intellectuals. Even Plato, while he did not disparage the use of aesthetic arts, did not encourage them nearly as much as Pythagoras did. But uh, Plato had a different type of mind. And in these different types of minds, we have explanations for different types of basic constitutions. I think we uh, may follow the general Pythagorean theory and affirm that temperaments arise out of types of reaction to motion. The temperament is therefore the way in which we naturally receive or reject a certain values in life around us. We have taken it for granted in our culture that man cannot accept everything, that the individual by wholesale acceptance may so diminish the intensity of his reaction that he is unable uh, to intellectually circumscribe his field of activity. Therefore, he is scattered, broken, or shaken in his directives simply because he is unable to understand everything and do everything. On the other hand, there are persons who by nature and instinct are, we will say, poetic conscious. These persons may or may not actually write poetry. Or if they do, their poems may be of various degrees of merit. Yet there is a sensitivity in them toward this type of reaction. In the terms of absolute poetry, we must have that which comes the nearest to a full uh, experience vision of internal rhythm or order. Relative poetry is that in which essentially the poetic mood is subservient to a transmissional form of some kind. Therefore, under relative poetry, we have that in which meaning dominates rhythm. We have the intellectual type of poetry. We have the propaganda. We have uh, the military rhythms. We also have uh, such things as anthems and things of that nature, in which actually we are using harmony or poetry as a means of transmitting a basic or fundamental idea. This idea, by the way, has a greater probability of being remembered or transmitted in poetic form than it has in prose form. The mind of man is curiously receptive to rhythms and is able to hold on to patterns that are rhythmed more easily than patterns lacking this quality. Also, we must admit that there is a considerable amount of poetry which is locked within prose structure. A great many prose works are actually of high poetic quality by the very use and selection of words and by the musical rhythms of the uh, prose text itself. We find this, for example, as a common circumstance in many sacred writings, in which by vir vir virtue of the way in which they are versed and ordered, and by the sublimity of their language forms, they give us rather the impression of poetry than of prose. We also know, for example, that in our own Bible, many works that are now in magnificent prose were originally poetic. And to a measure, this poetic substance has survived in prose, as, for example, the book of Psalms and sections of the book of Job. Uh, 
In these uh, points, we also note that the tendency of man has been to recognize poetry as nearer to sacred writing than prose in the majority of instances. The Greek oracles at Delphi and other places were nearly always revealed in the form of poetry, usually hexameter verse. Thus it came to the Greek consciousness that prose was the language of men and poetry was the language of the gods. When we analyze this more uh, carefully, we are really saying that poetry is the language of man's spiritual internal. It is the language of the transmission of vision to mind. For in everything which man performs, the value or its essential integrity must be uh, clearly present. It would seem that the interior psychic life of man not only reveals great truths of consciousness, but also reveals them according to the very law of consciousness itself, which means that it reveals them harmonically, inasmuch as consciousness by its own nature does not contain any breaks, any broken rhythms, or any crudities of presentation of its own context. Thus, in uh, the study of poetry, we come to a series of facts about man's own inner life. Namely, first of all, that the spiritual factor in man, manifesting itself, does so in an orderly way. In other words, consciousness manifests not only its content, but its form. And its form is always harmonic, melodic, or rhythmic. On the other hand, the labors of man arising from faulty or incomplete intellection are distinguished nearly always by inconsistency, incompleteness, or the confusion of ill-digested material. Man lives in a world here in which the known and the unknown mingle in a confused mass. And out of this confusion must inevitably come a kind of reaction in which uh, the content cannot follow smoothly. The person is subject to continuous interruption and the continuous changing of perspective. He is not able to maintain his own equilibrium. Therefore, to the degree that he descends into the material affairs of life, it was held by the ancients that he entered into a state of prose. We think of it perhaps at prose as being closely related to prosaic. And there is undoubtedly a psychic sympathy. The word poetry, coming from the Greek, simply means to make, to fashion, or to create. Therefore, the maker of a poem is a kind of creator. He fashions something. But the poetic consciousness with which he fashions is part of a universal consciousness in which rhythm and order are essentially inherent and therefore continuously present in manifestation. Uh, we have a wide range of poetic thought in relationship to Eastern philosophy and culture. And perhaps the uh, greatest exponents of this in Asia are the Chinese, Koreans, and Japanese. In these uh, groups, we find, for instance, the creation of the poem as a symbol of respect. We find that if a Chinese gentleman secures an admirable work of art, particularly a fine painting, which he regards with extreme respect and veneration, he will contemplate this painting. He will meditate upon it. He will search it as an experience of his own consciousness. 
he will try to unfold within himself the meaning of this picture to him. And when he feels that he has achieved this, he will write a poem. He will usually write a very brief poem and place it upon the margin of the painting in his own beautiful handwriting, which is itself an expression of almost uninterrupted rhythm. He will then seal it with his seal, and the poem and the picture will go on to future generations. Another owner may also experiment or react to this. His reaction may be different from the first owner. He will then add another poem. And in some of the very rare and early paintings, it becomes increasingly difficult to see the picture for the poems. But each of these poems has a distinct meaning of its own. It represents tribute. It represents the individual giving expression to his own interior, feeling about a thing. And to many Orientals, this expression is as beautiful as the picture inasmuch as it arises from the sole concept of the person. Therefore, we find frequently in Asiatic art that the picture is completely omitted from the scroll, and that the great poet simply prepares his poem, frames it as you would a picture, and hangs it on the wall. This poem becomes a kind of picture, inasmuch as it creates a mood, Thus we find in Asia, particularly, poetry and art interchanging, complementing each other, substituting for each other. In Asia also, where the contemplative life is somewhat stronger than it is in the West, poetry and uh, literature become the great release media for the intellectual. In our Western world, we would not expect a scientist to be a poet. We feel that if he did write poetry, he would write something about uh, relative states of gravity and so on, and we wouldn't find it particularly entertaining. But in the East, we expect the scientist to be a poet. We would regard him as an imperfect scientist. Unless he could come home from his laboratory or his school or wherever he may be, uh, put on his simple home costume, go out and sit quietly in his bamboo grove, and write a poem. If he could not do this, we would begin to wonder what kind of a scientist he was. We would say to ourselves, such men are dangerous. We would feel that this person, lacking interior imagination, lacking the power to touch or tap sources of beauty within himself, might be a rather brittle intellectual with whom we would have trouble one of these days. The same of the merchant. It would not be easy to assume today that someone under the stress of Western business would go home from a busy day at the office and dash off an ode or something like that. But this would happen in Asia. And while we have heavy pressures on us, Asia has also had many pressures with fewer resources to meet them than we have ever known. It is therefore part of culture, particularly pointed out by Lao Tse and Confucius, that the intellectual, uh, the practical man, the scientist, the philosopher, the warrior, all these should write poetry. Not only because it was a cultural requirement, but because it was a catharsis for a confused soul. It gave to the individual a peculiar ability to examine himself, to discover whether he had kept in touch with the deep springs and sources of his own consciousness. And if his consciousness becomes confused, if he is no longer able to divide consciousness from intellectual activity, if he is no longer able to divide his own internal light from his external profession, he is coming sick. He is becoming ill by degrees. And in time, this sickness will endanger his entire integration. The same concept, of course, moves through the um, Buddhistic philosophy of Zen. Uh, 
where the koan or the brief poem of seventeen syllables becomes symbolic of a great many values in life. One of the important elements of most oriental poetry, particularly Japanese and Chinese, is brevity. Brevity means essentially the power to go to the heart of a thing. The individual who is not certain, according to one Chinese scholar, writes a book. The one who is certain writes a poem. There is a certain poetry of certainty. If the individual cannot reveal his soul in seventeen syllables, he cannot reveal it at all. We are not quite so certain that we can do that, but we do have uh, certain evidences in our own way of life that brevity is not only the soul of wit, but the soul of transmission and the soul of revelation as far as the consciousness of the person is concerned. When we wish to make a truly profound observation, we may do so in twenty or thirty thousand words, such as it is said uh, was uh, the case in the publication of a small handbook on the culturing of carrots uh, by the government. It took really pages and pages and pages to take care of carrots. On the other side of the picture, we know that Abraham Lincoln wrote his entire speech for Gettysburg on the back of one envelope. The difference uh, in the totality of our understanding is expressed through the clarity with which we are able to express ourselves. Perhaps we have not recognized, for example, that essentially Lincoln's Gettysburg speech address is poetry. It is a magnificent kind of blank verse, yet it is moved from within itself by such tremendous rhythms, such magnificent harmony, that we would be forced to recognize it as great poetry, regardless of who wrote it. Yet perhaps Lincoln would be the last person in the world to think that he was a poet. It was merely that a clear insight expressing itself in the fewest possible unnecessary words, and because of the direct impact of vision upon purpose, resulted in the uh, speech taking the form of classic poetry. Thus truth has a tendency to take poetic form wherever it is manifested to men. And in this we have Truth not merely as intellectual fact, but truth as vision, as link between the person and a field of consciousness. It is in this way I am quite certain that Pythagoras uh, approached uh, his concept of, mu of poetic and music therapy. He recognized that if this poem, if this work, and he is believed to have depended heavily upon the writings of Homer for his the uh, therapeutic poems. If this poem is pure rhythm vision, and it is read to a person of enharmonic maladjustment, that the tendency of this will be to cause relaxation, to cause the individual to experience a different kind of mood. This mood does not depend upon the words alone, though the words may play a part. It depends primarily upon the psychic recognition of the harmonic principle. This recognition is intuitive. The human being who lacks the ability to recognize rhythmic motion as inspiration or as a source of well-being should of himself begin to examine his own nature because he is blocking his psychic life in some way. If he does not have a certain amount of music or poetry in his soul and is not able to call upon this at the, at the proper time and under the proper circumstances, 
he cannot have the same interior strength that would be his at a more aesthetic integration. We therefore divide the value of poetry from a therapeutic standpoint into two general classifications. One would be the therapy of creating or making poems. The other would be the therapy of good listening. The ability to receive into self uh, the poetic theme or the harmony of poetry. The creation of poetry naturally is a more positive action. It is one in which culture in general, but reflection in particular, play their parts. We always observe uh, that the person who is confused has difficulty in relaxation and has difficulty in separating his mind from the objects of confusion. Thus the person who is psychologically burdened comes home from his work, brings his work home with him. His only way of getting his mind off of the task, off of the worry, off of the burden which it is carrying, is to our normal way of thinking a violent release of some kind. He must take a strong stand. He must substitute willingly and willfully another interest, perhaps no more orderly than the first. He simply throws his mind from one kind of confusion into another, thus feeling uh, that he is gaining a certain release. One man said if he could throw his mind from an important confusion to a non-important confusion, he could relax. Well, maybe he could, but he will be tossing his intellect around indefinitely, and the wear and tear will be considerable. Actually, the transference of confusion constitutes one of our panaceas for life. We feel that our peace of mind must result from the complete occupation of our bodies and faculties. We are afraid of anything which actually suggests total relaxation. We are afraid we shall go to pieces. We are afraid we can no longer control ourselves if we once let down these barriers of will by which we dam up the currents and and torrents within ourselves. We are simply afraid of our own psychic content. Therefore, we try to fatigue it by continual activity. To a measure, we are partly successful. But out of all of this, we also find that the wear and tear results in marked increase in nervous ailments and emotional pathology. Under such conditions, the importance of poetry as a creating media may be regarded with some interest. Have you ever noticed that even in arts and crafts, skilled artisans have a tendency to fall into rhythms? The man driving nails, if he is an expert carpenter, will gradually develop a rhythm. People running machines develop rhythms based upon the machines. And one of the problems that confronted music therapy was the danger of a therapeutic or a music rhythm that would vary from the, from the rhythm of heavy industrial equipment. In other words, if a man is working with a certain type of die pressing machine, this machine has a tempo or speed of its own. If the individual's consciousness gets into a different type of rhythm, he is apt to have a dangerous or fatal accident. Thus, we have this point that machines have rhythms. And when the machine rhythm breaks, we are keenly aware of it as a good uh, automotive uh, mechanic who can detect immediately from the rhythm of the motor that which is likely to be wrong with it. Thus, there are rhythms innate in things. There are rhythms which also mean continued function. Uh, 
There are rhythms in the individual which also relate to continued functioning on one or other level of existence. In our particular concern, therefore, we should analyze, if we can, the rhythm of man himself in relationship to all things with which he comes in contact. Nature itself is uh, the source, of course, of rhythm symbols. The motion of animals, when slowed down by a modern uh, camera, becomes a very clear evidence of a total grace of movement, a magnificent orderliness the rhythms of tides, the motions of the heavens. All of these rhythms have affected man since the beginning of his experience. He has therefore followed a concept that to move with life is to ensure the function of life. To break rhythm with life is to endanger one's own survival. One of the commonest rhythms that we know of in life is the rhythmic alternation of activity and repose. Activity and repose also exists in music, in poetry, in art, and in practically all aesthetic media. Rhythm and repose we have to alternate in order to survive. This is so basic that very few persons question it. Yet at the same time, our tendency is to ignore the fact which is revealed through this alternation. Namely, that everywhere in nature we have a movement, a movement from action to repose, and a movement from repose to action. By repose, we mean, particularly in Taoism, the complete resting of the being. We have now come to the attitude that the only kind of repose that we can accept or understand is that which lies out of our control for the most part, and that is sleep. We suspect that in sleep we relax almost totally, unless some agitation disturbs our interior rest. But theoretically at least, man in instinctively reacts to sleep and relaxes. Whereas in his waking state, he is never able to attain this degree of detachment. One of the reasons, of course, why sleep brings this detachment is because it suspends temporarily the mental and emotional focuses of the consciousness. But in a complete state of rest or relaxation, man becomes receptive. Whereas in his condition of activity, he is objective. Therefore, in his life, there is a continual alternation between objectivity and receptivity, between aggressive action and receptive action, not receptivity alone, inasmuch as receptivity is also an action of consciousness. Thus the polarities do not represent action and inertia, but rather two polarized motions, one a flowing out from consciousness and the other a flowing back toward consciousness. In poetry this again is preserved in the patterns of meters and in the, pre in the creation of alternately or patterned emphasis and lack of emphasis. These situations refer again back to the life of the person very intimately. For every action that man performs which is aggressive, outmoving, and affecting environment or his own exterior standing, there must be a parallel or accompanying reaction. On the level of our conduct, we incline to consider this as the law of karma, because the quality of the action, in most instances, causes the reaction to be unpleasant. Therefore, activity results in fatigue, 
which we to a measure object to. Or a certain particular kind of stress leads to a reaction of a stressful kind. And we are continually plagued by the reaction of action itself. We try to say to ourselves, this I will do, but the consequences of this I will prevent. I will block it in some way. I will have an unpleasant thought, but I will immediately strive in one way or another to make it difficult for this thought to have its proper and inevitable fulfillment in my own nature. So defense against reaction becomes necessary because of the inadequate quality of the action itself. This breaks patterns, breaks law and order, and subjects the individual to the infirmities which come from what the moralist terms disobedience. Disobedience being violation of the basic rhythm of life. If, therefore, a person having a certain type of daily experience is able to let go of this experience, which is very largely an intellectual emotional pattern, and recognize the importance of the element of creativity, he should and must make something. The word poetry, therefore, meaning to make, implies one of the most important outlets of those who are in the need of creative expression. This is not in any sense of the word intended to depreciate any of the various avocational interests which have been developed in recent years as a means of balancing man's psychic tension. There seems to be no question in the world that the new rise of interest in good music and the tremendous amount now being spent by average citizens for stereophonic sound and things of this nature represents, in total, a natural interior reaction to need. We have come more and more also to recognize that need is largely individual. That we simply cannot tune on a program which 10 million people are listening to and find it always satisfactory to ourselves. Therefore, individual selection in music, as in art, becomes imperative. And out of this individual selection, we have restored what appeared to be a lost industry, and that is the recording and the tape record of good music. We are returning the individual musical reproducing unit into the home. If this be the basic pattern of something, we also have to realize that many so-called avocational interests are merely switch vocations. They do not reach into the core of our need. They help, certainly, as they divide attention away from the source of pressure. But an individual may become hobby-obsessed in the same way that he is vocation-obsessed. In fact, a great many persons, starting with an avocation, gradually make it their vocation. Now, there are advantages of this, it certainly divides what would otherwise be a monorail mental-emotional existence. It gives the individual a measure of variety in conduct. But very many avocational interests do not adequately release consciousness. They do not actually reverse the motion of life. They do not cause the direct flowing from within out. They simply juggle the things on the outside into new arrangements. There is a creativity in making a good chair. There is a creativity in taking a good picture. 
Many different activities give the individual relaxation and change of perspective. But there is something that is not quite perfect in the fact that an individual who spends all his days in a banking office has no other internal resource except to go home and cut out a bookcase. There is something wrong here. It is better that he makes the bookcase rather than do nothing. But there is something still better that he could do. Thus, all avocational interests which simply direct the individual to another phase of an existing pattern, remaining, however, on the same basic level. Such transferences leave something to be desired. And the something that needs uh, to be expressed is the pure internal life instinct of the person. The moment he limits this life instinct into some craft or trade, he is already repressing a large part of it. His daily life is also repressing most of his creativity. The person today whose job and whose creative instincts are identical is rare indeed. Nearly always a compromise of some kind has to be made. To meet this emergency, Ancient man instinctively developed these psychic expressions. He developed the ritualistic way of life. Today, ritualism pay, plays very small part in the lives of most people. Even the equivalent of the last century, the good street parade accompanying the arrival of the minstrel show, this has disappeared. There is practically no opportunity for ritualistic formula in the life of modern man if we wish to exclude uh, the Dodgers and their periodic high ritualism. <laughs> Actually, creativity or mass association in rhythm, in art, these things become scarce to us. In a way, radio and television have not helped as much as we wish they would. One of the difficulties here is that we are being forced more and more into the receptive field. We sit and listen. We may see, we may uh, hear, uh, we may gain certain psycho-emotional outlet, but we do not participate. We do not move into this rhythm ourselves. We are satisfied merely to be an audience to this. An auditor being very largely a person who attends something but not for credit. Merely to be there. Thus the uh, motion of our way of life is not to create a self expression, or release of dynamic internal. Compare this attitude, for example, with the Chinese scholar we mentioned, who having had a very large and important day in some mercantile establishment, comes home realizing that he is following a law of alternation. He is actually following a law of extroversion and introversion. He is going to balance these two. He is not going to run away from one and into the other. Our way in the West is to escape from one or the other. Very often we cannot listen to the rational conversations of people. They annoy us too much. Uh, particularly on politics or religion, where there seems to be no common ground. We are not inclined to be particularly concerned over revelations about trades or arts or crafts or sciences or the rise and fall of stock markets unless we are interested in these particular activities. But the true form of poetry representing an interior revelation 
of another person's consciousness is of interest to all normal, healthy people. Not because we wish uh, to pry into their private lives. Poetry is not a form of gossip. It is, however, a natural and healthy interest in that which is the internal consciousness of another being. After all, the consciousness interval is the one we have all tried to cross since the beginning of time. We have always longed to know how other people actually are inside themselves. We are locked in our natures, and we know they are locked in theirs. Any bridge across this interval is of interest and value to us. It is also of great social value to us inasmuch as poetry can be the, become the basis of understanding where all other more technical forms of knowledge cannot break through. So as a sympathetic listener, we seek to sense something of the mood, of the inner life, which lies behind even the simplest verse. Sometimes we find ourselves bewildered by simplicity. Sometimes we are unable to move ourselves into so natural and contented an attitude that four or eight lines of a poem is sufficient to give us a very warm and rich experience. But here again, a discipline suggests itself. If we are unable to find something in that which has meant something to another, we have more work to do on ourselves. The mere discarding of this as unimportant simply leaves us impoverished and with further barriers between our own lives and the lives of others. And barriers also cause sickness. They cause other people to be sick for lack of understanding. And uh, they cause us to be sick because we have not understood. All this subtle exchange of psychic content is perhaps more clearly and more immediately available in poetry than in any other art that we know. It has also been pointed out that poetry has a kind of illumination about it. Even the most conserv uh, conservative critics of poetry have pointed to the prophetic mood of it that a very great number of our so-called exact scientific, philosophical, industrial, economic facts have been discovered by poets. The poet never knew that he discovered them. He didn't care. All he was doing was expressing the law moving through him. If he was correct, he was an explorer of regions where more prosaic minds could follow. It has also been pointed very definitely to our attention that where great social message is implied, where it is necessary to lift man from one level of human achievement to another, that a large part of the world's most impressive, inspirational message has come to us in the form of poetry, that it has picked us out of this bond that it has resurrected integrities in human nature, that it has given us hope under great stress and strain. And the poem has become a universal force in the continuing, uh, continuing advancement of humanity on all social and psychological levels. Now our next concern <coughs> in this matter is therefore the effect of poetry is therapy in your own life. <clears throat> and here I think we also have something of value. Recognizing the primary importance of rhythm and of harmony and of creativity, we have in poetry a possibility within the average reach by which the person can create new integrations in himself. If he wishes a form of self-expression that is almost impossible to take away from him, which requires no appointed periods of time, 
which requires no specialized technical training. He may work with poetry. Now, some poets will say that this is a broad statement, that certain specialized training is necessary. It is desirable if it is available. But on the other hand, it is not necessary. It is less necessary in poetry than in any other form of literature. The great thing that is necessary in poetry is integrity. A tremendous interior honesty. Actually, the release of spiritual content will be as beautiful as our facilities permit. We instinctively draw heavily upon all resources in the state of sublimity. And in poetry, the individual is ineffective, completely so, unless a certain transference of levels occurs within himself. The critic points out that the technical point Textbooks on poetry all point out that a poem is produced as the result of an integration upon a level different from that of ordinary activity. The individual loses himself in something. At that particular time, a mood comes over him, the mood of the poet. The ancients felt this mood so strongly that they assumed that it was an entity, and they created a muse of poetry, and they dedicated most of their poems to this muse. They felt that poetry arose in a spiritual being, and that a poet was one who was able to sense this being, and upon whom this being bestowed its favors in the form of great verse. The followers of Pegasus, the winged horse of verse, therefore built their own mysteries, their rituals, their rites, and their ceremonies. And they invoked their muses with all the integrity and sincerity of any devout religious group. Their interpretation, however, rested upon this thing that happened to themselves. They felt that they entered temporarily into a curious uh, pattern of unworldliness. That at this particular time, something moved in them. Something lifted itself in their own consciousness. And they became uh, united uh, with a sense of interior vision. And a, a strong emotional factor was present. There can be no great poetry without some kind of emotion. But it was a kind of emotion that to the average person was more clean than the ordinary emotions of life. It was an emotion in which the search for the beautiful or the effort to express the discovery of value these pressures became irresistible. There was a desire to share. There was a sense of the spiritual significance, the doctrinal import of this form of self-expression. Also, due to the very nature of immediate impact, the individual, under the tremendous impact of a total reality, has always been described as speechless. The, uh, the faculties of great oratory disappear under the impact of a tremendous emotional fact, a revelation of life itself. Immediately, the mind, having experienced this, has the instinct to give it, to share it, to express it to release it into environment and immediately also discovers the hopeless inadequacy of words. In this dilemma, and it is the dilemma of great poetry, that which is not available in the term of word is made partly available through interval. 
Uh, Pythagoras pointed out that the music of the spheres was not generated by the planets, but by the intervals between them. And in poetry, we have a certain sublimity bestowed by interval and meter. We have certain use of pattern to make up for the inadequacy of word. A mystical experience in itself has a certain metrical quality, if we are able to grasp it. Among other things that we sense in mysticism is order, tremendous sweeps of rhythm, as expressed in Milton and in Dante and in many others of the great poets. So we use this medium in part, and then usually a very humble and very simple selection of words. The greatest of all vision poetry arising from mystical experience has almost the scriptural simplicity that we find in the words of Jesus. There is very little involvement. The entire sublimity is carried by the order and pattern and by words used more nearly according to true meaning than in other, any other speech that we make. So the resulting poem has a curious impact. It has the impact of purity. It has the impact of something of the impossibility of transmission, which itself becomes sacred. It also has the impact of nobility of sound order, rhythm, mantra. And, of course, it has the tremendous strength of being stated in the simplest possible words. The proof of vision is this very simplicity itself. So out of this man gains a peculiar sense of participation in value beyond himself. And this participation is therapeutic. There is no question in the world that it can and does react into man to cause him to come to a more harmonic relationship with life. In mysticism, then, we do find a strong tie between a mystical experience and the poetic form of uh, recording or perpetuation. We find that if we go deep enough into man, we find beauty. And we find this beauty expressing itself in the simplest forms of language. Now, the words themselves are not any more beautiful when a poet uses them than when anyone else uses them. Therefore, something has to happen to the words. They have to be divided away from common usage. And we divide them away from common usage and demand an entirely new perspective toward them because of meter. We therefore transfer them from the language of the everyday to the language of the gods. And by so doing, they become instinctively accepted by us as having a meaning or authority that is separate from profane utterances. Now, we often speak of the poetry of living, uh, the poetry of movement. We have many ways in which we use the term but always we apply it to something that has a particular, special, dedicated integrity, moving in it and with it and through it. In our daily living, therefore, if we are inclined to have uh, a certain type of fatigue, if we are inclined to wonder about the integration of our internal resources, it may well be that we could profitably include a certain amount of poetry reading in our list of desirable avocational activities. It is probable that we may first have to read or to become a little more aware of poetry before it is possible for us to create poems. And, of course, it is not important whether these poems are ever published or not. We are not writing poems by the yard for a publisher. What we are doing is finding ways of creating release. 
or pressure or tension within ourselves. To move it out, to get rid of it, and to find behind it and stronger than these broken rhythms the tremendous harmonic patterns of life and law and beauty and truth and love. These laws lurk in us, and the most direct way of letting them come out is through the emotional experience of poetry. Now you will observe that uh, in our modern generation, poetry languishes. It is almost impossible to publish a book on poetry unless you happen to be one of two or three world outstanding poets. Even the greatest poet is very fortunate if his book will sell a thousand copies. Today we have very little interest in poetry. Uh, poetry to the large degree languishes except what might be termed serial comic poetry. Various little prancing uh, melodies that amuse us or are created merely as caricatures of life itself. We find then a certain fatalism, a certain brittleness, a sarcasm, a cynical attitude toward life, and a group of modern poetry which is distinguished largely for its non-melodic, non-harmonic forms, not necessarily just blank verse, which can be great verse, but poetry arising largely from psychosis itself. We know such poems. We read them too frequently. We observe also that poetry, instead of being as it was to the ancients, a, minister, a ministering goddess, is to us merely another example of our own disillusionment. Our impoverishment in this form of literature uh, is consistent with the general psychic impoverishment we are going through. We cannot necessarily demand that other people change their ways, but we do know that we have an inheritance of great art, great music, and great poetry. We also realize the possibility that great poetry will help us to establish rhythms will help us to feel melodic harmony in our own minds and emotions. And that it is quite possible that with moderate experimentation in this field, that we shall also find poetry as a means of personal release, of restating for ourselves convictions that do not mean much in prose. They become too matter-of-fact, too commonplace. But in poetry, they suddenly become divine. And this search for a means of expressing great spiritual conviction leads us naturally into the realm of great poetry. Pythagoras read poems to put people into a more peaceful mood, to direct certain rhythms toward the remedying of ailments. And I think elaborate research could be carried because the, the exact therapy probably lies in the combination of the meaning and the meter. There is a meaning peculiar to meter. There is a meter peculiar to meaning. Therefore, when these come together, they produce a strong therapeutic pressure. They give the individual a certain distinct message, a message which is accepted not only mentally and emotionally, but psychically within the consciousness itself. The total result of this, of course, is, the, is an immediate experience of exhilaration of conscious value. It causes the individual to sense, under the term of poem, a value which he can accept as poem, because it bypasses his intellectual criticism. It bypasses what he calls fact. You are not supposed to analyze a poem as you would analyze a scientific thesis. You are supposed to enjoy it. You are supposed to permit it to make you pleasure, to make you feel better, to make you sense beauty and value. Thus escaping the direct influence 
of man's sophistication. The poem, if it is acceptable and proper, moves in upon us as a more religious experience, a, an experience based upon our effort to capture a fragment of eternal beauty and preserve it for ourselves and perhaps rather timidly to advance it toward others if they wish to share it with us. This type of therapy is part of maturity. The individual who is unable to sense such values is simply lacking in maturity. And no one wishes to be regarded as immature regardless of their conduct. Therefore, uh, it is to be desired and to be hoped that there will be a revival of good poetry, that there will be more interest and emphasis upon this phase of our living in order that we may sense its help in time of trouble, that we may recognize that its vibratory rates and patterns can be, like all other great art, a form of therapy. Just as a great painting, by its expression of cosmic realities in order, color, dynamics, brings a ministry of mathematical exactitudes to our soul as great music lifts us into the communion with these harmonic principles which govern all things. So great but simple poetry can also elevate us, but it comes to us in a rather more humble and intimate way. It comes to us so near to home, so within our availability, that it is present in the life of the child. It is present in many persons who have never dared to express it. Let them have the courage to do so. Let them feel that in this form of self-expression, they have a means of both understanding and being understood. That anyone who has a maturity of consciousness will share in the experience of this personal release of good. To make this more habitual will probably be an excellent remedy for neurosis. To make us more aware of, and continually expressive of beauty will lift our minds from these desponds which cause us to be continual expressors of deformity. The individual who is constantly telling his troubles is not only telling them to other people, he is restating them for himself, therefore giving them greater and greater authority over his own life. If instead of this he reads a beautiful poem, or recites one he has written, or shares in the melodic and harmonic concepts of nobility which have flowed from the souls of poets, and can also flow from his own soul. If he takes these means of expressions, he is getting at the totality of himself, the wholeness of his nature. He is not correcting the momentary headache. He is correcting the cause of all headaches. He is not merely solving the imminent crisis in his family. He is reaching into the source of all crisis and trying to make it right. For well, there is no crisis in human affairs that can withstand the full expression of true beauty, beautifully and nobly revealed. And in this type of feeling and in type of thinking, we have the maturity which is necessary to bring security, peace, and integrity to our way of life. Time's up.